Yeah. Hey.
one thing I like about visiting the East Coast is that nobody calls me Paul Milton. They just call me Paul. <laughs> Only here is my name Paul Milton every single time. It's a great name. It means, Paul means small. So they got it right. I'm a tiny little person. All right, is this on now? It's green. Okay, so here's the issue. I know exactly what I want to read. I just don't know which order I want to read it in. So, so I guess we'll start with <clears throat> I'm going to regret this, but let's start with James 1. And verse number 27. So I, I had in my mind what I wanted to do. Then I typed on my phone what I wanted to do. And then I wrote notes about what I wanted to do. Every single time has been different. And now what I want to do is different from what I wrote in my notes just literally like 15 minutes ago. So I'm not sure how I want to go about this yet. And it's mainly the order of things. It's, not, it's the same thoughts. I'm just not exactly sure how I want to order this. So uh, the reason I, I think I should start here in verse 27 of chapter 1 is that if you read the whole book of James, it, this is kind of his thesis. This is his primary argument. If you read, so you go through the, it's just like a regular re a paper. You would read a paper and it would be like the introduction and it would be like this is the topic and this is who I am and this is what I'm studying about or researching about and then you get down towards the end of like a few paragraphs and then it's like bam and there's the argument that they're trying to make and then they go through the rest of the paper trying to support that argument with evidence. And if you read James, he kind of is always coming back and supporting this verse. And this is um, this is a bold statement, right? Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So we see James later on, he's talking about works. We see James later on talking about deeds and faith. We see James later on talking about humility. We see James later on talking about... Um, Boast, now this one we'll actually get into about boasting of things you can't control. We see James talking about taking advantage of people. We see James always coming back to this argument, this, this primary argument that he's making here. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Um... My grand, I, I visit my grandfather every summer. Is the driving reason we actually um, go to North Carolina at this stage of my life anyway. Um, he's 96, World War II veteran, infantry. Um, never been on a plane, but he toured the world. And then, um, so he's got all these great stories, but nobody really talks to him long enough to actually hear his stories. Because he, what he does is he has, as my brother puts it, he has this collection of greatest hits. And when you sit down with my grandfather, he p starts pulling those greatest hits off, right? And if you don't sit long enough, you're just going to hear the greatest hits over and over and over again. But if you sit down with him long enough, then he starts getting into the deep tracks, right? He starts getting into stuff you've never heard before. But it takes time. It takes a lot of time. And then um, he's had multiple strokes and heart attacks. And he's been a preacher, actually, on my phone. He's like, this was him just, uh, that was him just a few weeks ago, actually, preaching. He's 96. And then, um, so he stood up behind the pulpit and preached. He lives on his own. Stopped driving about two years ago. But it's just something that it is. And you just, we never visit with him long enough to hear those stories. Well, last summer, they moved him into this bigger house. So there was enough room for my family to stay with him the whole time. And so... We watched MeTV constantly, and then, um, which, by the way, some great shows that I didn't know about. 
um, on MeTV. So anyway, um, so we, I, I, was, I had all this time to just sit there and just let him talk. I didn't have to say anything, just let him talk. And then my grandfather became a different person to me um, last summer. He just became a completely different person because all of a sudden I'm hearing things. I'm like, whoa, wait a second. I've never heard this before. And he lost his wife like 2004. And we started talking about death, which he talks about a lot. So we share this fascination with death and, um, and a healthy scare, you know, fear for me. Him is a reality. For me, it's just a fear right now. But, um, but we, we were discussing death and he was saying, um, he's like, you know, you get to the end of your life, and he said, you've worked so hard to build relationships, and you've worked so hard to develop friendships, and you've you saved money, and you've bought cars, and you've bought houses, and then he said, and then there's that moment, and you look up, and there's nothing. There's just nothing there. It's just you and the end of life, yeah. and there's nothing else there. And then, um, and he was saying, and he was just crying when he was talking to me. But he was saying, it's just like, um, all these people are saying that we're with you, we're, but it's, it's, it doesn't matter. It's just you. It's just you at that moment. That's all there is there. There's no anchor to the world. There's no cage that's holding you down to the world. It's just you by yourself. People are around you maybe, but it's just you by yourself having to face this. And there's nothing that you've ever built, nothing that you've ever bought, no relationship you've ever developed that does anything to anchor you to this world. Um, it doesn't mean you can't value that at the end, but there's nothing there. You're gone. I mean, you're going, it's just like, I remember when Stephanie had her first baby, I think it was Kylie. I'm pretty sure it was Kylie because this doesn't make sense if it would be another baby besides Kylie. But um, <laughs> she was just like, in her mind, she was like, okay, if I get up and I walk out of this room, I'm, I don't have to have this baby, you know? So in her mind, she had, she, it would just, it would just I'm, if I just get up and I walk out of this room, I don't have to have this baby. And there's, there can be people and doctors and all of that around, but that's something that she had to face and it had nothing to do with anybody else. It was her, and which is the closest thing I can think of. But to hear that come out of my grandpa's mouth, it was really odd because, um, He's everybody's favorite person. And you would think that if anybody felt connected to this world, if anybody had these deep relationship ties and something that anchored them to this world, it would be him. You would, you would assume that, knowing him. He has no enemies, like none. And, but that's what he feels. And it's not really loneliness. It's just a realization that we, we're there and we try to do what we can while we're there and then we're gone. And there's nothing to anchor us. There's nothing to keep us. And the Bible talks about, which we'll read in a minute, the Bible talks about a vapor. You, don't anch you can't anchor a vapor. You can't hold back a vapor. You can't do any of this. It's just, it's just there, and it is gone. And um, the brevity of life, it was just, uh, I don't know, that was the summer, and I was, and I was thinking about that, and it took, it took me, obviously, <clears throat> straight to James 4, <clears throat> which we'll talk about in a second, but, um, but we're talking, you got to think of how we view life. You know, like we as Americans even, we have this idea like that the world is, is just all about America. But if world history stretches across the stage, starting from over there, like this is America, right? But we feel like we're important as people. And it's, it's natural, right? But this is world history, and this is America, right? And even inside of this is us, you know? And yet, how important do we think we are, really? Like, do we really think we're making this huge impact? You know what I'm saying? And I'm not trying to diminish things that you do. I'm just saying, understanding every single generation Every single empire, every single person felt exactly the same way. Okay? <clears throat> so, actually, let's go back to Luke 12. 
So on the surface, this actually is going to feel like a, a money message in a way, like rich versus poor and kind of thing, but it's not. We're going to actually talk about, we're going to dig past the money part, okay? Um, in verse number 13 of Luke 12, and I'm going to drink one more sip of coffee. And one of the company, people who were around him, said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. Now, do you think that they were dealing with the same problems then that we're dealing with now? I mean, that should be enough, that should be enough right there to prove that humans are the same no matter when they are or where they are. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he made to divide the inheritance, divide the inheritance with me. He said unto him, Man... Who made, I love that, man, who made me a judge? Um, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall these things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now all my life, and all of our experiences are different, and you sat under different preachers, but all of my life, this verse has always been about um, don't get greedy. You know, if you have what you need, you know, kind of like this idea, like Eastern idea, like if you have what you need, then you just take what you need and you don't grow more and then build bigger barns. But that's not what it's saying at all. Like if you decide that, like, okay, my, my fields are great and I can buy this extra 20 acres and then you can develop those 20 acres and you can build bigger barns, then go for it. There's no problem with that. So what's the issue here? Okay. He's not saying that it's wrong to build bigger barns. He's not saying that it's wrong to make more money. He's not saying that it's wrong to increase your goods, increase your fields. What is he saying? What is the problem here? I mean, you can answer me. It's not a rhetorical question. Huh? The focus, the value. Where, where's the value? Where, where's the, what's the basis of the valuation on that barn, on that bigger barn, on that bigger field? What is he actually speaking against here? What's the question? What drives this parable? He's saying, huh? Yeah, it's, it's, it's proud, but you can still have bigger barns and not be proud of them, right? You can be wealthy in humility. Like, I don't think it's that necessarily. But it's just, it's, it's just basically, it, it's like this, this idea of focus. It's not this idea that, that what he has is obstructing the greater good, is obstructing his eternal vision. Okay? So what Jesus is saying is like, you're coming up and you're asking me about some inheritance. Like, I'm literally healing sick people here. Okay? Like Dr. John. I'm literally healing sick people. I'm literally walking out into this desert or wilderness, going to people's homes and raising dead people, and you're coming to talk to me about inheritance, about your money. And he was just like, even if you got money, even if you got the inheritance, even if I said he gives you all of it, and you go out and you, and you spend it wisely, and you grow that wealth, even if you did that, and then you die, whose is it now? What does it matter? Now, he's not saying don't go out and work. Actually, the Bible is for work. He's not saying don't go out and, and, and you know, avoid work and, and, then, and then you just, you know, don't make yourself wealthier or whatever. He's not saying that. Now, in other places, he, he, he talks about the dangers of that, does he not? But in this right here, that's not what he's saying at all. He's just saying no matter what it is, that's something that has nothing to do with what I'm doing, with this eternal good, right? So what you're doing is, is you're letting this stupid 
wealth, this inheritance, and it doesn't say what the inheritance is. You know, I mean, the inheritance, like, I've seen families fight over coffee cans. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, it, it doesn't have to be great wealth. We're not, it might not have even been talking about millions of dollars. It could have been literally like, he gets the shovel and I get the rake, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, it could have literally been, I mean, we've all seen this, right, in families that are fighting over inheritance. We don't know what the size of the wealth is, but all we know is, is that Jesus is saying it doesn't matter because then you're going to die, and then somebody, i got to answer this same question all over again about your money. You know what I'm saying? It's just stupid. Why are we even talking about this? So you're going to get this money, and then I'm going to outlive you, I mean, obviously Jesus didn't say this, but I'm just like, and then I'm going to outlive you, and then you're going to die, and then Junior is going to come up, and he's going to ask me the same question. Why, does it, why can't Junior and the third split the inheritance? And this, we're talking about the same money over and over and over again because it's not yours, and it's going to be here when you're gone. So there's this eternal thing that we're missing, okay? So the way I've always heard that was the bigger barns thing, but I'm like, ah, that's not really exactly what he's saying there. So maybe you've heard that your whole life, but I haven't, so I thought I was mentioning it. So it's not the money, it's this other shallow approach to life. It's a very shallow approach. If, you know, um, I completely understand what it's like to have things happen that are out of your control where you need money, okay? I know what it's like. I've had situations in my own life, but I, I've, I've seen much, much harsher situations in other people's lives where it was things that were out of their control that forced them to have to think about money. Like, I'm literally, I have to eat. I have to have shelter. Those kinds of questions. And, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people who have lost sight of this eternal vision. They can't see past their wallet. They can't see past their job. They can't see past their hobby. They can't see past whatever it is, you know. And sometimes even church work. Let's just, we'll use church work. That way that we all know that I'm not just preaching about money. I want to make everybody to make sure of that. All right. Church work. Churches can get so busy that they're not actually seeing the eternal good in what they're doing. Because all they're thinking about is let's just be busy. Let's just be busy. Let's start this program, this program, this program, this program, and then you get to it and you're like, you're like, why are we doing all of this stuff? I mean, you, and you lost sight of this eternal vision. Even good things can do this to you. All right? Go back to James 4. So he talks about, in James 2, he talks about basically faith and deeds. In, in James 3, he talks about keeping uh, the tongue and then having control, of, you know, self-control. Um, I'm not going to talk about that because I'm 300 pounds, so I'm just going to move right past self-control. We're just going to ignore self-control and just act like it's not there. All right, and then we're going to go right over to chapter number 4. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Among you come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members. You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, you cannot obtain, you fight and you war, yet you have not, because you ask not. I mean, he's really covering all of his bases here, right? You ask and receive not, because you ask and miss, that you may consume it upon your own lust. So he's like, even when you ask for the right things, all right, I want this church to grow, right? That's a good prayer, right? I want this church to grow so it can reach the community. And if they pay me this sizable salary, we'll just be okay with that too. You know, you know what I'm saying? So even good things can become something different. All right? Um, you ask and receive not. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? What do you talk about in James 1.27? Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Are we going back to the thesis here? Is he trying to provide some support for that? Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy, but he giveth more grace? Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but give grace to the humble. 
Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Did I not draw nigh to God? And he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. This is starting to sound like Psalms now, isn't it? Um, very Jewish uh, in its tone, right? If you will. Um, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. I mean, this is, this is sounding like he's just pulling straight out of Psalms. Um, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save another uh, and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Be careful how you approach judgment on people. Because what you're doing is you're doing more than saying, well, I'm a fruit inspector. That was what it was when I was growing up. We're fruit inspectors. And then uh, the Bible says you need to have the fruit of the Spirit, and I'm inspecting your fruit or whatever. What it's actually saying here is like you're, you're changing the order. The, it, not, I wouldn't say social order, but you're changing the hierarchy there. And what you have lawgiver, you know, and you have judge, and you have the person who has to obey the law, and you're basically trying to elevate yourselves up in that rank. Um, verse 13, go to now, basically, listen you, that uh, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. Now, are we talking about plans obstructing eternal vision again? Okay, what's the John Lennon song where he says, life is what happens while you're making plans, right? Is that not true? I mean, like, we make plans, we make plans, we make plans, and, it, and I'm like, it's, everything's a 10-year plan. The first five years is the actual, is planning it. The next five years is trying to make that plan happen. So you miss that five years. So for every 10-year plan you have, you've just lost five years. Or at least that's the way it's been in my life anyway. So anyway, so like... Um, so we, we, we plan and we plan and our conversations are consumed by planning. And it could be good plans. There's nothing wrong with planning for the future. There's nothing wrong with planning for your children. There's nothing wrong with planning for education. There's nothing wrong with planning for retirement. Whatever those things might be. But what's happening is, is like, you're planning on borrowed time. You're planning for borrowed time. Now, I have known and you have known, because you can't get to hardly any age without knowing people who die an untimely death in a lot, a lot of different ways. Just in our wedding party by itself, we had, a, uh, one, uh, we had a 20 year old who died in a car accident. She was nine months pregnant. She was two weeks from her due date when she was killed in the car accident. They saved the baby and then uh, the baby's still alive. And uh, that's been 20 years ago so, or more. So that, and then we had another friend of ours who was an usher in, in our wedding and crack overdose, and he's gone. So both of them happened very young, less than 25 years old, both of them. So it's just like, okay, that's just in a small wedding party. Let's branch out. How many more stories do we have? How many more stories do we have? I mean, I have friends of mine who's, who's had, I had a friend who's had a sister murdered. I know my, my own uncle was murdered. His son was in prison for murder. That's just in my family and people I know. And those are crimes. That's not even people who died from car accidents. That's not even people who died from disease. That's not people. I mean, this is, we're just talking about just crime. You know? This stuff happens, guys. This stuff happens. Don't you love talking about death? Isn't it awesome? No, I'm just kidding. So anyway, so like this stuff happens. It's, there's just nothing you can do about it, and you don't know. So what he's saying is, is like, you're making these plans, and you're completely losing sight of where your life comes from. You're completely losing sight of how brief your life can be. You're completely losing sight of these things, right? Yeah, so now we have a vapor. Remember that? American history, and we're this tiny little speck in American history, and nobody but your family will remember your name. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to be that guy, but they're not going to remember you, and they're not going to remember me. 
And 50, 100 years from now, nobody cares that we were here. Now I'm starting to sound like a 19th century Russian writer, but I mean, that's just the way it goes. Nobody is going to care. So we have to figure out what it is that we're doing with our life and our relationship with God in that amount of time. Not thinking of what's happened in the past, not thinking of what's coming in the future. What is our relationship with God now? How are we treating people today? We're not talking about money. We're not talking about any of that stuff. We're just talking about what's underneath these parables, what's underneath these metaphors and these similes. What is there? What, what is our focus? What is obstructing our view? In James number, uh, chapter 5, he uses that phrase again, go to now, which is like, listen up. You rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered. And the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. What is he saying there? This is where you've been putting your efforts. It's not about the rich part. It's about just, this is where you've been putting your time and effort. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, like mowed your fields, which is of you uh, kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. And that's going back like we talked about this Jewish language that they're using. Yes, very Jewish. Um, yeah, so now he's getting into something a little bit deeper. He's saying that your fraud is going to come back to judge you. Defrauding people or whatever, you know, is, is going to, this is going to come back to judge you. The way you treat people for personal gain, the way you manipulate people, this is all going to come back to bite you. This is what you're going to be judged by. Because what you do is you build this wealth. And it doesn't have to be gold and silver. It's, he's just using, he's trying to, you know, obviously there was a really big distinction between the poor and the, and the wealthy at this time. So he's just trying to make sure you see what's happening here. We're stacking gold and silver up. And this is where all of our effort is. But that gold and silver is rotting. And it's rusting. And it's brought by fraud. And that is going to be our judgment. That's going to be our judgment. Do you think that you have to have money to, fraud, to, to, for, to commit fraud? Do you think you have to have money to have these issues? Is this a wealth issue or is this a human issue? Yeah. So it's easy for us to read the rich man, and all of a sudden it, changed, it completely changes the way we read the Bible. Once we see the word rich and the word poor, the way we read the passage changes. Because now it's them. It's the big corporations. It's the CEOs. It's the whatever. Not understanding that a CEO definitely can be fraudulent and can be selfish, and that his lowest employee can be fraudulent and selfish as well. So this person over here who makes far less money can embezzle money from this person over here. But this isn't a Robin Hood society, is it? So that's just as wrong as the other guy. It's all it's this human problem. It's not about the amount of money, and it's easy for us to think that. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts <coughs> As in a day of slaughter, he hath con condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Now I want you to go back to James chapter number 2. Now you can see kind of why I was struggling with how the order I wanted to present this stuff. But it was, um, in verse number 1 he says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly... A man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit, th sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, 
rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? In other words, aren't these the same people who are like taking your money and taking you to court and suing you all the time? And yet you're just... Uh, um, <laughs> Yet you're just, uh, you're, you're, you're favoring them. I was about to say something different, but it's probably not appropriate for this venue. So uh, you're, you're favoring them. Like you're, you're, you're kissing the hand, if you will, of, of the rich people. All right? So who's at fault here? The rich, the poor, or the person who is receiving both? Right. Who's at fault? It's not the rich man. It's not the poor man. It's the person who is at the door greeting them. Right? But when we read it, we get that rich poor thing. It changes the way, oh, the rich are evil. We shouldn't, we should probably go after the poor. You know, blah, blah. it's not that. It's just saying that we should be equal in the treatment of others. Okay? So we got to sit, where do, where do we fit in this? It's not about rich or poor. It's about how we receive both. And why are we spending so much time and effort as Christians? And I've seen it in multiple churches where we just embrace people when they come in because we know they have a checkbook. We know they have a checkbook. And there's actually a term. It was a business term first, and then churches started using it some, and it's called negative growth. And what that means is, is that you're bringing in people who don't give money. So your church is growing in number, but not in money. And that's negative growth, because you have more people to take care of, but you have the same amount of money. But should a church ever use a word like that or a phrase like that? Negative growth? You see what I'm saying? And we, I've seen it over and over in churches where it's just like, these are the same people who in your community vote against you having zoning so that you can put your church in these places. These are the same people who are driving up prices on land and all this stuff that we're welcoming in and we're saying, but you have a checkbook. Welcome. You know what I'm saying? And that's what he's saying here. They're the ones suing you. They're the ones taking advantage of you. Why are you welcoming me? Why are you spending so much time and effort welcoming these people when you have someone over here who is vile, unclean, whatever the situation is, and that's where we're at. So these issues are not limited to rich. So what I wanted to basically talk about here for the last two minutes, and I'm done. The last two minutes, and then I'll say, I'll say a prayer, and then we'll be gone, and I refuse to watch the Super Bowl, thanks to the officiating in the NFC Championship game. All right, so I, I, I could not preach today without saying that. Like, it was, like I could not say that. So... For some people, the NFL lost integrity a long time ago. For me, it happened two weeks ago. <laughs> All right, so anyway. Um, the brevity of life. That is what should be driving our vision, driving our decision-making. The brevity of life. It has nothing to do with responsible, irresponsible in the way that we think of it. We, we see, oh, this is a financial planner, this is whatever. That, that's, that's, that has its place. Right? What I'm talking about is understanding and respecting where your life comes from, understanding and respecting how short your life is, and understanding and respecting how little it's going to matter. Like, this is the only time you matter. This is it. And if you blow your life, then there's no more time for you to matter. It's gone. Nobody's going to remember your name or whatever. This is your time to matter. Okay? Even the, even the greatest people who have made the most impact in this world, how many times a year do you think of them? And I'm just going to throw names out there. It has nothing to do with anything, but I'm just so you know. Starting with Mother Teresa. How many times do you actually think about Mother Teresa? How many times do you actually think about some world leader who did something extraordinary 
It's like maybe minutes of a year. Maybe minutes of a year we might think about that person. And they were probably the most influential human beings on earth in our lifetime or in our generation. And we think for some reason that we can do all this planning and we can form this inheritance and we can do all this other stuff and somehow our life is going to make this huge impact outside, outside of us. And it's not going to. This is your time. Now I sound like the Goonies. Now is our time. Our time, right? So it's like, this is your time. And what you do with it today, what you do with it tomorrow, that's it. And it has nothing to do with like depressing subject of death. It has nothing to do with how wealthy you are, how poor you are, whatever. This is it. You get the one shot. And I know that you've heard it over and over again. I've heard it over and over again my whole life. And I tell students in my class, I teach seventh and eighth grade, and I'm like, you will go, you will wake up and you're an adult. You wake up and you're there. You're like, at first you're like, oh my gosh, this is my first job. This is so cool. I'm flipping burgers or I'm frying fries or I'm doing whatever. This is neat. Oh my, I got a $50 paycheck. Boom, and then bam, you have kids. You have a full-time job, you have rent, you have a car payment, and you're like, what, where, did this ha where did this happen? When did this happen? Like you wake up and it's there. And then you wake up and it's over. Yeah. And we do not, I mean, I think it's, I wouldn't say, I won't say evolutionary because I'm in a church, but we don't, <laughs> but we have this thing that like we can't, we can't get our minds around it. We can't quite grasp it. And no matter how many times we talk about it, we go out and we do the exact same thing. And, and Jesus and James are basically saying in these two passages, don't do it. Don't do it. I don't want to talk about inheritance. I don't care. Don't do it. Change your focus. Don't do it. And that's all they're saying. And I think about my grandfather, who actually says, it feels like life is taking forever for him. But, um, but anyway, I think about my grandfather, and he's sitting there saying that when you get to the end, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's all those relationships, all the money, all the jobs, all the effort I put into all that stuff. And you wake up, and you're looking there, and you're like, this is about to happen. There's nothing that can hold me back and nothing that this other person can do is going to help me. I'm on my own. You know? And I could not get this off my mind and when I can't get something off my mind, that's what I go with. Because I'm like, there must be a reason I can't get it off my mind. So I know this is crazy depressing at 11.30 on Sunday morning. And I get it. I get it. But... Here's the deal, like, you can make decisions this week that will change this. So I'm not saying that you have to change your whole life plan. I'm not saying any of that stuff. This is depressing, but this is something that you can do today that completely changes your, your focus and your vision. It doesn't take trips to the altar. It doesn't take you reading your Bible every day. It doesn't take you committing to this big mission project or anything like that. It's literally, what can I do in the next 24 hours that will demonstrate that I have not lost sight of my eternal vision and that I am not obstructed. My, my view is not obstructed. It doesn't take any self-discipline in that sense for these, all this other stuff. All it just takes is like, what does he say in, one in one, chapter 1, verse 27, the thesis? We'll read it one more time to close it out. James, I don't want to misquote it. James chapter 1, and then I'm done, I'll pray. James chapter 1, verse 27, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Dear Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come preach today. <clears throat> and it's always nice to come back and see friends and and be part of this church that was so gracious to us for our, in time here, our entire time here. And I 
pray that everyone will stay safe as they go through the week and as they travel back and forth to work and stay safe on their jobs and keep their families safe and a hedge around their families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.